dear students, welcome to the segment on uh, the modern elementary literature by Mathura Uh We were at a place where he was actually comparing the style of Thucydides to that of Sir Walter Raleigh. And uh, we'll come from the beginning of the paragraph. Let us now turn for a contrast. Uh, he had been talking about Thucydides, uh, the ancient Greek historian. To a historian of the Elizabethan age, also a man of great mark and ability, also a man of action, also a man of the world, Sir Walter Raleigh. Sir Walter Raleigh writes the history of the world as Thucydides had written the history of the Peloponnesian Bear. Let us hear his language, let us mark his point of view, let us see what problems occur to him for solution and see how Walter Raleigh uh, completely justifies the aggressive nature of his writing. Uh, in the next quotation we have, seeing that we digress, this is from Walter Raleigh, that we digress in all the ways of our lives, yes, seeing that life of man, seeing the life of man is nothing else but digression. I may be better excused in writing their lives and actions. And uh, what are the preliminary facts which he discusses? You will find, uh, he now is the table, table of contents, you will find of the permanent and of the waters above the permanent and whether there may be any crystal heaven or any prima mobile. You will then find of fate and the stars have a great influence and that the stars have a great influence and that their operation may diversely be prevented or furthered. Then you come to one or two entire chapters on the places, place of paradise and on the two cheap trees in the garden of paradise, etc. Okay. So, uh, he quotes at length uh, from Raleigh and then puts a question, which is the ancient here and which is the modern? which uses the language of an intelligent man of our days. It's quite obvious his answer is, he is a Hellenistic, not only because he is a Hellenistic, but because he deduces uh, the modernity of Thucydides. Which a language wholly obsolete and unfamiliar to us, obviously Raleigh's language, which has a rational appreciation. Even today, we are not sitting in the Victorian world as Matthew Arnold was. But even today we can fully understand that uh, Raleigh's style cannot be uh, or Raleigh's uh, perspective, his point of view cannot ever be compared with anything that's modern. There may be some elements of modern, of the modern or modernism in it, but it cannot be dominantly called a modern attitude, a modern outlook so to say. What has the rational appreciation and control of his facts? Which has the rational appreciation and control of his facts? Which wanders among, the, among them helplessly and without a clue? It is our countrymen or is it the Greek? And the language of Raleigh affords a fair sample of the critical power of the point of view possessed by the majority of intelligent men of his time. So he is taking up Raleigh as an example. And the language of Thucydides affords us a fair sample of the critical power of the majority of intelligent men in the age of miracles. So taking up one as a representative, taking up the author of the language of that person as a representative of a whole class of people, it somehow reminds me of the touchstone method which, for which he was famous, Arnold was famous. But uh, of course that's uh, not very much in context over here. But still it reminds me of that. Well then, in the age of Pericles, we have, in spite of its antiquity, a highly developed, a modern and a deeply interesting epoch. Now we have been reading so much about uh, the age of Pericles. Let's tell, us, tell you something more in detail about this period. Pericles was a leader of Athens who fulfilled the Aetherian dream of imperial glory, so to say. 
the most important figure uh, in the history of classical Greece. Pericles actually came from aristocracy, but he had a rather democratic point of view. Uh, and he, as a king, as a ruler of Athens, uh, you know, announced a glorious vision in which there would be inspiration to every art. You can see the democratization of everything. Uh, and there, is, there should be employment to every man. And Athens should go for everlasting fame by you know, human resource, or better to say in today's term, human resource development. And under him, Athens became a buzzing center of intellectual activities. He placed hold or paid host to Anaxagoras, the philosopher who actually discovered that the moon uh, did not re uh, emit any light of its own but reflected the light from the sun. To Herodotus, we have already talked about Herodotus, who was the first historian, uh, Iskylus, and Euripides. Now you can very well understand this tree. Uh, you, you very well can remember this tree, uh, dramatists of the Greek period, Sophocles, Iskylus, and Euripides. Now he was actually, he actually played host to Iskylus and Euripides. And the whole city of Athens under him embraced everyone in democracy. So this is uh, the Periclean age in its socio economic and it, in its cultural aspects. And uh, Anwar, uh, Anwar calls it, in spite of its antiquity, in spite of uh, it being a, you know, a remotely distant in terms of history, uh, a highly developed, a modern, a deeply interesting period, interesting book. And then comes another question. Is this epoch adequately interpreted in, by its high, highest literature? This is around 5th century BC. Now the peculiar characteristic of the highest literature, the poetry of the 5th century, has already established this. That if you go for a characteristic of the highest form of literature, a characteristic of a highest form of literature, you are uh, most uh, you are most prone to find it in poetry. The poetry of the 5th century in Greece before the Christian era is its adequacy. Now, this is what he calls adequacy. Adequacy in the sense that it is something that can contain both the contemporaneous, both the topical and the universal. The peculiar characteristic of the poetry of Sophocles is its consummate, its unrivaled adequacy. That it represents a highly developed human nature of that age, human nature developed in a number of directions, politically, socially, religiously, morally developed, in its completest and most harmonious development in all these directions. While there is shade over this poetry, the charm that of the noble serenity which always accompanies two insights. So the first part is a topical part, the second part from while there is shade over poetry, it actually the true insight comes from a kind of universal vision. And if you read Sophocles, you have, uh, you know, uh, if, uh, in this course most of you have read Sophocles, and you know how Sophocles was actually in Oedipus Tyrannus, Sophocles was actually reacting to that, uh, you know, to the onslaught of the sophists who prioritized man over gods human action over destiny. Uh, that is the topical reaction. And you can also understand how through the best he uh, you know, uh, delineates an universal, the universal human tragedy. So uh, this is why he uh, particularly uh, points out Sophocles, on all particularly points out Sophocles. And Sophocles seems to represent the energy of the Athenian. Let's come to the next uh, sentence. If in the body of Athenians of that time there was, as we have said, the utmost energy on mature manhood, public and private, 
the most entire freedom, the most unprejudiced and intelligent observation of human affairs in Sophocles, there is some, there is the same energy, the same maturity, the same freedom, the same intelligent observation. Not all this idealized and glorified by the grace and light shed over them from the noblest poetic feeling. And therefore I have ventured to say of Sophocles that he saw life steadily and saw it whole. Seeing life steadily is representing all the divergent aspects of life. Seeing it on the whole is you know, finding in it the universal features of life in general. And then uh, comes the next paragraph. I assert therefore that the detailed proof of the assertion must be reserved for other opportunities. That is, if the 5th century in Greece before our era is a significant and modern epoch, the poetry of that epoch, the poetry of Pindar, Skylas and Sophocles, is adequate representation and interpretation of it. And then comes what he has to say about the poetry of Aristophanes. The poetry of Aristophanes is an adequate representation of it also. True, this poetry regards humanity from the comic side, but there is a comic side from which to regard humanity as well as a tragic one. And the distinction of Aristophanes is to have regarded it from the true point of view on the comic side. So of course it's comedy and uh, you know often, most often comedy is treated as a kind of an inferior form. It is believed that there, there was a part, a, a part dealing with comedy in the uh, in Aristotle's poetics, and that part was mutilated and torn and you know, actually uh, you know, destroyed when it came into the hands of Roman Catholics. So, uh, and if you have read that very well-known novel by Umberto Eco, Eco called uh, the. I think it's called the Game of the Rose or something like that, the Name of the Rose. Uh, then you find it's a kind of a detective fiction set in uh, you know, Benedictine, a Benedictine monastery in the ancient in the ancient days, in the medieval days rather, in which that part uh, of the poetics is being sought out. Now, uh, I think it's in the name of the year. The name of the novel is The Name of the Rose. It's by Umberto Eco, the Italian uh, novelist. <clears throat> so let's come to Aristophanes, as he was talking about. And Aristophanes is a comedian, but his comic perception is, according to Arnold, uh, is a right perception. He has a kind of a proper perception, uh, though the perception is. You know, he is one of the. Uh, let's give you some ideas about some idea about Aristophanes. He is one of the earliest practitioners of the comedy, which is called old comedy. In fact, uh, he got the first prize at the annual Athenian Drama Festival in 426 BC for his play, play the Babylonians, where he actually satirizes Athens' conduct during the Peloponnesian War. Now you can see the, that a work that you can look at the level of civilization over there, the work that satirizes the nation, the nation state, or the nation state's conduct of itself, is getting the first prize. You can see the atmosphere of liberalism. And then it is followed by another play called the Knights. And uh, You know, there is always, I mean, this is a, you know, he is the father figure of what is called the old comedy. And what you find over here is that he celebrates the ordinary people and attacks the powerful. And uh, there is always this kind of a subversion of audience expectation. Now, after talking about Aristophanes, uh, you know, 
the last line that he says about Aristophanes is there is shade therefore over his poetry and charm the vital freshness which is felt when man and his relations uh, are from any side inadequate adequate and therefore genially regarded so you can see he is talking about Aristophanes and Aristophanes according to him was an adequate uh, literary uh, creator an adequate dramatist who actually reflected his time and then he will go on to speak about and make a kind of a comparison between Aristophanes and Menander and we will come to this in the next segment thank you